and welcome to another episode of the IEEE Power and Energy Society U.S. and Canada Student Podcast. This is our monthly conversation with guests that inspire us, speak from experience, and drive innovation. I'm your host, Clinton Gadet. I'm a third-year electrical engineering student at BCIT in Vancouver, Canada. And on the screen with us today is our uh, Director of Marketing and Social Media, Priya Mana, and our mentors and executive producers, Asala Dharmawardina and Conrad Schmidt. And uh, absent today, but always helpful, are our, our, our producers, editors, and administrators extraordinaire, Adamir and Paul Nieto. And as always, this podcast, oh, and Shani as well, welcome to the team, new member. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I'll, as always, I just wanted to let you know, everyone watching, this podcast is made for you, the students and the young professionals in region one to seven. So please be brave, ask your questions in the chat or ask to be unmuted and we can and you can speak with us directly. Um, just go ahead, let it fly. Our WebEx attendees are limited to region one to seven PES members, but we are proudly streaming on, face, on Facebook for anyone in the world to watch. So without further ado, it is an honor to introduce our guest this evening, Amori Levins, welcome. Thank you. Amori Levins, I'll, I'll, is, I'll do a quick bio here, is the co-founder and chairman emeritus of Rocky Mountain Indust Institute, which he served as chief scientist from 2007 to 2019, and now, now supports RMI as a contractor and trustee. He's been an energy advisor to major firms and governments in over 70 countries for over 45 years. He's an author of 31 books, more than 700 papers, and he is an integrative designer of super efficient buildings, factories, and vehicles. Received, he has received 12 honorary doctorates and countless awards from all over the world. He currently is an adjunct professor of civil environmental engineering and a scholar of the Precourt Institute for Energy at Stanford University. And he is a very busy man doing lots of things, pushing himself out of his comfort zone. One, uh, one of the things I found out is he, he likes to teach things that uh, he's never um, officially academically studied in to keep his mind fresh and challenge himself. So we'll try and challenge the man today. Welcome, sir. How are you? Very good. Yeah, Very engineering good. is one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, so in, in, uh, in, in bringing you on, we, we, um, it's, it couldn't be better timing. The, the, you were early, early to the, to the ideas of, of renewable energy movement in the 1960s and 70s before it was so part of the public lexicon. Um, can you describe kind of what those early days of, of, of energy advocacy and energy, just the thought, the shift from, we have all this energy in the ground, let's burn it to maybe that's not the case. Well, I realized in the late 1960s that energy was kind of a master key for unlocking the tangle of issues around population resources, energy, environment, development, security, economy, uh, and for issues like water that it wouldn't directly solve, it would at least give you some good hints about how to think about it. Um, in those days, there was no place you could go to study energy policy. It, it emerged de facto from what people learned in uh, schools of power and petroleum engineering and law and accounting. Uh, and uh, the energy problem was then thought to be, where do we get more energy, more of any kind from any source at any price? Right. Uh, when the Arab oil embargo broke on the world like a thunderclap in 1973, I was two years after resigning my fellowship at Oxford to go work on energy. Uh, it was I was a little early for Oxford to accept it as a, a course of study for my doctorate. I was a, a don, but they said, energy, you know, not an academic subject. We haven't a chair it and pick a real subject. Uh, I said, I think it's going to be very important shortly. That, in fact, there's going to be an almighty train wreck. I need to go work on it. So I'll just resign the fellowship and go do it. So I did. Uh, they now know why it's important. Uh, in fact, they realized in 73 why it was important. They now have 300 people or so doing very good work on it and have a number of chairs in it. I was just a few decades too early. Uh, but working with Shell and others, I gradually 
reformulated the problem to be not about projecting and building to meet uh, homogeneous demand, but rather asking, what do we want the energy for? What services are we trying to provide with it, like hot showers, cold beer, smelted aluminum, baked bread, comfort, mobility? And for each of those end uses, how much energy of what kind or quality at what scale from what source will do the job in the cheapest way. Uh, that later came to be called the end use least cost approach. And of course, if you ask a different question like that, you get a completely different answer. Uh, the question's the hard part. So I wrote all that up in an establishment magazine called Ford Affairs in 76. It started a huge controversy, basically reframing the energy problem. In those days, efficiency in using energy was thought to be rather dubious and unimportant. Many people thought that energy and GDP climb up forever in a frenetic embrace, yeah. and decouple them. And then they thought the same about electricity. Both of those, of course, have now gone by the wayside. But people really said in those days that if we tried to save energy, we'd be back to caves and candles because after all, everybody lives in a market economy and it's perfectly efficient. So all the efficiency worth buying has already been bought. Mm. Renewables in those days did not include wind power in most circles. It was thought rather bizarre that somebody might make wind power cost effective. Uh, photovoltaics were on very expensive satellites, but the notion you could cut the cost a thousand fold wasn't really in anybody's radar. Yeah. Uh, and uh, therefore solar meant thermal panels for hot water. Right. Yeah, so now we're over two terawatts of that stuff. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's two orders of magnitude more than the official forecasts of even less than a decade ago. Right, so like energy efficiency was a, was a precursor kind of in, in, the, in the path that you were on and, and, and um, the things that you experienced, it, it was a logical precursor to renewable energies because the technologies weren't even there. It was the most like low hanging fruit would be to like make it efficient instead of like, let's hope for a thousand fold efficiency improvement in solar panels, which didn't come for 40, 50 years. I was saying over the next 50 years, we could roughly triple US energy efficiency. We've already saved about 60% of the energy per dollar GDP. Wow. Um, and, you know, by 2010, we discovered enough further efficiency opportunities that might like three times more uh, and or actually twice what I originally thought and a third the real cost. So factor six from 1975 levels. But I, I think we could well get there because we've lately figured out over several decades how to design buildings, factories, vehicles, equipment as whole systems for multiple benefits not as a pile of isolated parts for single benefits. And that turns out to be able to increase the savings several fold from what most people still think uh, and cut the cost. In fact, you often get increasing returns just like renewables. So the more you buy, the cheaper it gets. We call that integrative design. And it's, it's still not widely used, taught, expected or rewarded, but I'm trying to spread it. Integrative design, okay, okay. Uh, elaborate more on, on integrative design. Well, let me take this this building from which I'm talking to you as an example. It's now dark here in Colorado. Otherwise, you would see that behind me is a passive solar uh, banana farm, uh, 85 square meters, six wow. banana trees, 100 kinds of higher plants. Banana crop 78 through 80 are ripening nicely, but there's no heating system at 2200 meters elevation where it used to go to minus 44 Celsius up near Aspen, Colorado. Wow. Banana. And it was cheaper to build that way because you save more construction costs leaving out the heating system than you pay extra for the stuff that gets rid of the heating system, super insulation, super windows, air to air heat exchangers. Similarly, out in the driveway, I've got a BMW i3 electric car that's made of carbon fiber. And the supposedly prohibitive cost of the carbon fiber is paid for by needing fewer batteries to move less mass. Right. Right. So that's a great the example. Of small to pay for the light weighting that doesn't need so much power trade. Right. Uh, 
or let me pick a mechanical engineering example. Uh, a little over half the world's electricity runs motors. Most of the, or half, half the motor power runs pumps and fans, mostly pumps, same physics, different Reynolds numbers. And uh, if the pipes and ducts that move the, say, water and air coming out of the pumps and fans were made fat, short, and straight rather than skinny, long, and crooked, you would cut the friction 80 to 90 odd percent. In this building, it was 97 percent. And the capital cost goes down. Uh, basically, the friction in a pipe goes down is nearly the fifth power of diameter, but the cost of the pipe goes up is about the second power of diameter. Okay. So if you optimize the pipe as a component, you pessimize the system. But if you optimize the whole system, you use big pipes and small pumps, in fact, teensy little pumps, total capital cost goes down. And you also lay out the pipes first, then the equipment. So the elbows go away, most of the friction goes away. And if everybody in the world did this to all the pipes and ducts, you would save about a fifth of the world's electricity or half the coal-fired electricity. And you'd get your money back in under a year in retrofits and instantly in new builds. But this wow. is not yet in any standard engineering textbook uh, course, except mine, as far as I know, uh, or any government study or industry forecast uh, or climate model. Why not? Because it's not a technology. It's a design method. Yeah, most yeah. people don't yet think of design as a scaling vector, a way to make things big fast. But obviously, efficiency and renewables are complementary. Uh, renewables already outcompete new and even existing thermal power plants in, well, let's see, new ones in over 90% of the world, existing in over half and soon in all. Uh, and the, the more efficiency you buy, the, the fewer renewables you need. Right. So to illustrate what the potential is, a decade ago, we did a book in a number of languages called uh, Reinventing Fire, which you can find online. And it showed how the U.S. could run a 2.6-fold bigger economy in 2050 using no oil, no coal, no nuclear energy, at least a third less natural gas, uh, $5 trillion cheaper than business as usual, assuming that avoiding climate change and, and pollution are worth nothing. Right. Uh, and at the same time, we'd make the power system half distributed and highly resilient uh, and uh, reduce the carbon emissions 82 to 86 percent. If we reran that today, renewables are even cheaper. We'd probably be at a one to half degree scenario still many trillions of dollars cheaper. And then the Chinese government ran a similar exercise we helped with, uh, with even more spectacular results, increasing GDP per unit of fossil carbon by a factor 13. Wow. Uh, energy productivity sevenfold. What would be that? percent less coal, save $3 trillion. Wow. So what would be the, what would be like the top three major things you're, you're talking about that would need to systematically change in order to achieve this? Are you talking about technical things or policies to do them or what? And that's, that's up to you uh, in, to interpret that. Yeah. Well, probably the first two are efficiency <laughs> and then renewables and, and reliable, resilient grid integration, right. which we can also talk about. Uh, and for policy, there's, you know, a very, well-established slate of standard ways to do it. There are a lot more uh, to which I would add three, the three biggies, integrative design and rewarding it. Uh, so you pay your designers for what they save, not what they spend. Mm. Um, uh, what, what's called decoupling and shared savings so that provi regulated providers of say electricity and gas get paid for cutting your bill, not for selling you more energy, and therefore have the same incentives as the customers. That alignment's mm -hmm. really important. That one seems trick that one seems so counterintuitive. How would how would we convince them to hey, hold, hold on, hold on a second. And then yeah. the third thing is uh, 
uh, to apply social discount rates to some important private purchases, like if you're going to buy a car, use a fee bait. That's a fee for buying an inefficient one and a rebate for buying an efficient one, which nice. big depends on how efficient or inefficient they are compared to the uh, norm for for that size and type of vehicle that year. Mm -hmm. And you can make the fees pay for the rebate, so it's revenue neutral. Uh, and you know, right now, if you if you buy a, a car, uh, what, how efficient it is is about as unimportant as whether it has floor mats, because you only look at the first year or two of fuel savings with a typical high consumer discount rate. But if you take a long societal view of it, as you should, uh, then you look at the full, you know, 15 or whatever years of savings, and you'll make a much smarter choice for everybody. Uh, now, on decoupling and shared savings, the issue there, uh, which is solved in oh, 26 of the United States for gas and about, I think, 18 for electricity, but not the rest, is that when a utility forecasts how much electricity it's going to sell and how much revenue it needs in a future year, uh, if they then sell more than that, then their profits go up because the schedule of tariffs was based on their projection of sales to each rate class. Right. If they sell less for whatever reason, you know, weather, bad business year, whatever, their profits go down. So they're at risk for stuff they can't control and they have an incentive to game the forecast by arguing over what's the right number. Right. So get rid of those complications by saying, okay, we'll just accept this forecast for the sake of argument. And if you actually sell more than that, your extra profits will be escrowed in a bank account. And if you sell less than that, we'll make you whole out of the bank account. So you're indifferent to how much you sell. You're not going to be rewarded for selling more or penalized for selling less. No volumetric incentive anymore. But right. <clears throat> the other part is called shared savings. If you do something smart in how you buy or produce energy or deliver it or help your customers use it more efficiently, guess what? We'll let you keep maybe a tenth of the saving is extra profit. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So again, aligned incentive. So a friend of mine, a Canadian civil engineer, another former chairman of RMI named John Fox used to run the biggest demand side program in North America at Pacific Gas and Electric. He had that system and oh, 1992, I think he invested 170 something million dollars to help customers save energy cheaper than it could be produced even in existing plants that generated about 400 million in present valued savings the regulator gave 89 percent to the customers as lower bills and 11 percent to the utility as higher profits over 40 million dollars straight to the bottom line at no risk and no cost to the company because they recover the investment amortized over a mm. couple of decades just like any other in cost effective investment so uh, he tells me that if you have that kind of financial performance, uh, the CEO will call you up every week and say, is there anything you need? And all the smartest people in the company will want to work in your efficiency department to advance their careers. So that alignment of incentives between provider and customer really changes cu culture and behavior. Yes, yes. But th is there... There seems like there is a strong moving current in a different direction. That that is that is the battle, isn't it? Well, there's a lot of different currents. This okay. we're in a period of of high turbulence. Yeah, I'll just sure. give you an example of a few examples of what's going on. Uh, in Australia, uh, the state of South Australia, which has no coal-fired or hydroelectricity or pump storage, just passed uh, 93 hours of running entirely on solar power and 110 hours, I think, of running entirely on solar and wind power. Uh, the regulator required them to get 4.4% of the power in the latter case from gas for stability from rotating machines, angular momentum, 
but that's all because they just install, installed four synchronous condensers, which use no fuel. And, and that all ran just fine. Uh, and that's an over gigawatt scale grid. First time that's been done. Also in Australia, the German firm Zalda, now a subsidiary of Shell, will happily sell you a scheme called Zonen Flat, which means if you pay once something like 13,000 US dollars, you just bought your electricity for the next 20 years. They provide the solar equipment, the battery, the controls. They aggregate you into a virtual power plant. And if you don't have the money handy, a third party will finance it for you. You have a positive cash cash flow from day one. <clears throat> and uh, you'll in seven or eight years, you'll own all, the whole system. Wow. Now that, how does a utility compete with that kind of offering? Or another example, in Holland, uh, you can go on a website called Fundebron, literally from the source. It looks like a music file, sw file swapping website except it gives details in a picture of various folks in Holland who are producing renewable electricity of the stated kind at a stated price. And you can buy it directly from them. Right. All the, all the uh, delivery and settlement happens behind the curtain. So a friend of mine who happens to be a German utility executive living in Holland decided the price was right to buy his electricity from that guy shown holding a really cute piglet. Sure, sure. Pig farmer, <clears throat> and he, he does biogas electricity. And then at Christmas, my friend gets a long handwritten Christmas card from his electricity provider. Oh, that's great. What utility is, can dream of such customer intimacy? Yeah. Is there, is there going to be a, first thing that came to mind, um, was will, will there be a tension between the utilities, the grandfathered in older utilities who have um, invested in the infrastructure and then the people who are trying to change things, change the system who are using that infrastructure to perhaps disrupt and usurp those us utilities? You bet, it's all up for grabs. See, yeah. we're, we're moving toward a grid that is, as a Canadian colleague said, uh, decarbonized, decentralized, digitized, and democratized, the four Ds. Right. Uh, and the biggest part of that transformation is the information revolution that informs and organizes uh, the customers to take power into their own hands. You know, it's generally smart to sell customers what they want before someone else does. Yes. Yeah. A lot of customers are figuring out they can buy a lot fewer electrons, produce them themselves, use them more productively and more timely and trade them with each other. Yeah. Yeah. So who's going to do that and how well will they do it? And wouldn't you like to do it in a way that works, whether the grid's up or down, you know, I'd, I've had one power failure here in 25 years, although my neighbors sometimes have several a day, uh, <clears throat> because before we had IEEE 1547, starting 2003, I did a workaround to allow auto islanding. And I have a 65 kilowatt hour battery, which is probably a lot more than I need. I have then five and now 18 and a half kilowatts on the roof. So I'm a threefold net producer, run the meter backwards more than forwards. But I don't care if the grid's there or not, because my system works regardless. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, I might see on the news that my neighbor's lights are off. So I go outside and check sure enough, their lights are off and I come back in, watch the news some more to see when their lights will come back on. Right. There's and now, and now the auto islanding and microgrid technologies are almost getting to a plug and play yeah. state where it's, it's just it's super plus, easy. Plus grid forming inverters. Right. Yeah. It's getting to be very exciting. And another thing about the Australian situation, <clears throat> they have quite a few big batteries, uh, which at a range of over a thousand kilometers can step in in milliseconds to stabilize the grid if, if a half gigawatt unit fails, as happens pretty often there. 
uh, and uh, you know before the lignite unit a thousand kilometers away can even start to react the big battery already solved the problem and the first year they had their first big battery the value of of gas peakers fell by something like 95 percent wow another example in east denmark a country that is oh let's see probably 80 odd percent renewably powered this year i think 86 was expected we'll see um the east danish wind operators are bidding wind power into the day ahead hourly auction just like a peaker or some other fuel generator because the forecasting for wind is so good now that they have more confidence they can deliver X megawatts at four tomorrow afternoon <clears throat> than the grid operator has that if they push the button at four o'clock, their peaker will actually turn on. Wow. Isn't there some irony in the, in the or maybe even tragedy in the fact that um, as the shift lags more and more as the worldwide meetings of leaders lags behind where we need to be more and more weather gets more unpredictable and therefore these renewable wind farms are, are their systems are getting less predictable which is kind of a shame i mean well, I, I think they're actually more predictable in general than demand and so mean, it's solar you you mean okay i get like the wind the technology for predicting the wind and the machine learning has become so good but i'm what i'm saying is that it's it's kind of a shame that like all that's been trained with this data that's been pretty reliable and as the climate around the world gets more and more erratic oh. um, it might, well, might throw a wrench in the works uh well be careful uh it is kind of good sport to blame renewables whenever fossil plants fail uh that's been happening lately in britain on the european continent uh, it happened in texas but it's not what the data show. Sure. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> take, take the Texas example in the big freeze, February 2021. I've been through the data in detail. Uh, <clears throat> renewables underperformed for a total of 10 hours. The maximum underperformance against ERCOT's uh, extreme winter forecast, which is the applicable one for February, uh, is, uh, I believe, 1.3 gigawatts, maybe 1.2, uh, at a time when the gas plants were underperforming by over 30 gigawatts. And by the way, that wind underperformance was 18 hours into the emergency. Right. Didn't cause it. Come Didn't on. cause it. Yeah, yeah. No, of course. And I wasn't saying that the, the I was just saying that the, the bidding would be thrown off a little bit as far as the the economics that you were talking about the bidding on the peaking of the wind just because of the i mean i i guess i have an anecdotal experience um we've just had uh incredible flooding in the vancouver area for the past two weeks um and bc and we've got three gigantic unprecedented rainstorms in a row and it's just not letting up and it's just uh it's never happened before like this so it's it's a wake-up call for sure. Def definitely weather gets crazy. Uh, yeah. My ex-wife Hunter talks about global weirding. Uh, right. And we know what's causing it, and we know how to stop it. Using energy in a way that saves money is the most important way. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the big issue, I think, for a lot of electrical engineers is the this notion of how will we do with a lot of variable renewables keeping lights on reliably and resiliently and of course <clears throat> you notice i'm using the term variable not intermittent why yeah. because their variability is so predictable the the forced outage rate from technical failure is a fraction of a percent much better than for thermal plants which are typically around eight to twelve percent so I think the term intermittent is is more properly applied to big thermal plants. And interestingly, their grid integration cost is typically higher, often by several fold, than that of good renewable portfolios. Why? 
because the big thermal plants fail in bigger chunks for a lot longer and far less predictably. Mm -hmm. Their grid integration cost has names like reserve margin, spending reserve, cycling costs, uh, cycling O&M, lifetime reduction kind of stuff. And those costs were traditionally ignored and socialized as inevitable system costs. Right. right. Uh, <clears throat> now, if you want to integrate variable renewables into the grid, you have to pay attention to a variety of timescales spanning 15 orders of magnitude from milliseconds to decades. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but there are at least 10 carbon free grid flexibility resources you can use to do that. You start with efficiency and there's a new NREL paper weeks ago showing that optimal building efficiency, buildings use three fourths of US electricity, uh, <clears throat> will reduce say hydrogen for seasonal storage that many people claim you need uh, that investment goes down by over an order of magnitude. Wow. Yeah. Uh, because you lengthen the thermal time constant of the buildings, you reduce the net demand. You can think of efficiency as having an important demand response component that competes strongly with storage. Then there, besides megawatts, oh, and one other word on megawatts, in reinventing fire, we showed that the U.S. can could, could by 2050 at historically reasonable speed save three quarters of its electricity by systematically applying best 2010 technology whose average cost is a tenth of the current retail price of electricity. That tells you we didn't buy nearly enough efficiency. Okay, right. And yet most of the projections like the Princeton one uh, showing all these granular and very problematic grid expansions and so on land use those those typically assume two to four times the electricity use that we found and we didn't buy enough efficiency but they bought even less mm. so you got to compete or compare efficiency with supply if you're going to spend your money sensibly and if you don't spend your money sensibly if you if you don't buy the the cheapest fastest ways to decarbonize then you're saving less carbon per dollar a year and making climate change worse than it should have been. Yeah. Okay, then besides megawatts, there are flexawatts using electricity more timely. In Texas, we found that resource is about three times bigger than had been thought and very cheap. Uh, <clears throat> there's of course better forecasting, better grid integration across larger uh, market clearing areas. Uh, there's um, integration with electric vehicles, an immense source of storage and ancillary services growing very fast. They just in September exceeded 10% of the world passenger car market. Yeah. It was ahead of schedule. That's exactly where I wanted to go, actually, because you've mentioned a few times storage. And one thing we have not been able to really get to well with any of our um, previous guests is really talking about storage. And uh, that is something that I am so passionate about. I really think that's the one thing that's lagged behind. We've found ways to generate um, electricity, but I don't think we've necessarily gotten to the same level with storage. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on what would be some of the best ways um, that for the people watching, if, if you are in their shoes and they're interested in storage, where, should, where would they direct their, their efforts career wise? Well, I, I would let me just continue with the, the track I was on because I was outlining 10 grid flexibility resources and okay. they're not all storage. Right. Uh, so another one is there's a lot of dispatchable renewables and dispatchable cogeneration that you have to run anyway for the process heat. Uh, there's diversification of renewables by type and location. So, for example, looking at the Midwest wind belt from the Canadian border to West Texas, uh, we found you could get twice the firm power from the same capacity if you 
uh, used anti-correlated sites. The developers, for some reason, didn't do that and left half their money on the table, but you can do it after the fact with synthetic contracts. Then there's thermal storage. It's a lot cheaper to store heat and cool than to store electrons. Uh, and the electric vehicle storage is, is really interesting. Uh, the, first of all, in the vehicles, because they're parked 95, 96% of the time, you know where they are or they know where they are. Right. And uh, <clears throat> some of them are now being designed to be bi-directional. Well, there's a firm in, in Europe called the Mobility House, which has a few competitors, it's in Zurich. And they uh, make a good living uh, dispatching car batteries, both for storage and for ancillary services. Three years ago, they already had a car in Germany licensed as a power plant, selling frequency stability services to the grid. Right. And there are, there are at least 21 services that a battery in a car or a second life battery that's come out of a car can sell to the grid and that company's selling 13 of them already and making a, about a thousand euros per year per battery pack. Wow. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. And of course you can imagine a lot of business models involving aggregators or the automaker uh, selling those aggregated ancillary and storage services to the grid. And the numbers are just huge. You get way more storage than you need. So basically, and then there's bulk storage, right? And of course, it can be batteries. It can be raising and lowering blocks of concrete uh, or running uh, heavy rail cars up and down a piece of track. It can be pumped hydro, compressed air, could even be power to X chemical storage, although that tends to be more expensive. But <clears throat> why do we go first to assuming batteries? because they're the costliest of these 10 grid flexibility resources. With so if you go to a battery with conference, the shortest lifespan. there's, well, yeah, they, if you go to battery conference, all the arguments are about my battery is better than your battery, but very few people like to talk about what does any battery have to compete with to do the same job? Yes. Yeah. So I wouldn't think of it as storage, but if you do think of it as storage, yeah, there's a lot you can do. Uh, but behind the meter battery has, you know, in your house has 13 main benefits. And that's enough to make money on it. Uh, in some cases, without the energy storage. Mm -hmm. there, in fact, the, the better, more detailed uh, distributed benefits studies uh, show uh, that photovoltaics often pay for themselves without even counting their energy output mm. just from other forms of value and if you want to read about that i have a 20 let's see 2004 economist book of the year you can find online called small is profitable the hidden mm. economic benefits of making electrical resources the right size and it documents 207 distributed benefits of distributed electric systems, all of which, by the way, also apply to efficient use. Wow. What's the, what is the, I, I have to prod at that one. How does, how does that work? The, the solar panel without its actual intended use, I elaborate on that, how it, how it actually becomes. What you well, just said? It, it can sell frequency and voltage stability. It can sell resilience. It can sell negacarbon. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff it does for you besides just producing electrons and it frees up a lot of uh, grid capacity. It can provide free reactive power on demand. Right. That's more valuable than real power. Uh, good inverters can do that. Um, and <clears throat> the, uh, it, you know, think about an example like Hawaii, which is kind of ground zero for getting off the grid. It's actually worth your while if you build a house in Hawaii not to connect to the grid. Right. Uh, they have about a 30 cent tariff and you could do a lot better than that with uh, PVs and batteries and 
efficiency or if you buy less efficiency, you can get a little generator set that runs a few hours a year. Right. And it, it's just a better deal and much more resilient because after all, 98 or 99% of power failures originate in the grid, about 90% of those in distribution. Right. So if you run off your roof, no wires, you know, there's there's a lot less to go wrong. Absolutely. Um, and, and therefore, to get back to your original question about the grid, uh, what, as, as electric cars expand, take over the market quickly, make batteries cheap for everybody, not just for cars, yeah. that implies deep distress in the natural gas industry because they'll lose the whole combined cycle market. It's going away fast. It implies the end of thermal power stations generally. And it may imply the stranding of a lot of grid assets that may become like phone company copper displaced by wireless, displaced by fiber. Yes. Well, this sort of, of, of transformation gives utility executives nightmares, but it gives venture capitalists sweet dreams. Absolutely. So very interesting times. Yeah. I mean, they just, just very classic cliche disruption. That is it right there. Yep. Um, and I, I also wanted to ask, well, like you, you've been so prolific, you've written so many books, you've traveled the world, you started your own Institute. Um, a lot of the people watching today, uh, I think would really benefit just knowing you've, 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 uh, you've contracted consulted for CEOs. Um, you've worked with engineers, you've taught yourself multiple disciplines. Um, when you see successful engineers, young engineers coming up, like what, what are some markers of success? What makes young people succeed with their first journey out of school? Well, as Rick Miller, the wonderful founder, just retired president of Olin College says, maybe our best North American engineering school. Um, the, the engineer Imagine something that has never been and then does what it takes to make it happen. So instead of asking why, you ask why not. There was a, a DARPA uh, manager who was really good at this. If somebody would say X is impossible, he'd say why? And they'd say, oh, well, you'd have to do Y and Z. And he'd say, oh, well, that's what we ought to work on then. And then they'd say, well, that's impossible. Why? Because of A, B, and C. Well, then we ought to work on those, right? And then I would look for engineers who are fearless. Uh, it doesn't mean you won't fail. In fact, I hope you'll have plenty of instructive failures and learn quickly from them and not make the same old mistakes, but only make interesting new ones. Uh, but uh, don't take any crap from the system. Uh, study a lot of different things that seem perfectly unrelated to each other. And if, yes. you're, if your advisor raises eyebrows and say, I don't see how this is related to that, you're probably on the right track. Uh, I would um, have, I, I would, know a lot about a lot of things and have a very strong wide angle lens, a lot of peripheral vision, because a lot of what we need is putting pieces together that haven't been assembled before because people didn't see how they could connect. And I'll give you a small example. You're familiar with, with this sort of gadget. Now, because of the way its makers like Apple and Samsung uh, paid for battery life, they drew a very strong innovation in small, light, safe batteries. Uh, that then made the battery technology affordable for cars. Then you'd make a zillion batteries, that made the batteries cheaper, and that certainly ridiculously cheap. Uh, and that then had all the other consequences we've just talked about, 
including the end of thermal power stations. Uh, so <clears throat> if you imagine, uh, you know, when Henry Ford and Thomas Edison, whom he used to work for, uh, went on one of their car camping holidays together and woke up and saw their industries today, they'd recognize everything except the electronics that catch on to that pretty fast. But I imagine Ford mischievously muttering to Edison, let's see what happens when electricity displaces gasoline in my cars. And then those electric cars will add flexibility and cheap distributed storage and they'll make batteries cheap for everybody. And that'll help the grid integrate variable solar and wind power along with other kinds of grid flexibility. And then distributed renewables re will replace your thermal power plants in their grid. Wow. I like the, I really like the way that you have presented this entire picture is really refreshing because it doesn't seem as that we need some drastic technological holy grail unlock. It's really quite conceivable that when we get to a certain critical mass of electric vehicles alone, just that simple thing of everyone's cars transitioning to electric vehicles, all of a sudden we have storage and we have transportation and we have flexibility and we have like uh, microgrids all in one right there. So it's not that it's not that far off. It just needs to, we need to get to a critical mass and we need the bi-directional flow built into housing infrastructure and vehicle infrastructure. Yeah, it's got to be designed right and resiliently and securely and all the good stuff that, that we need great engineers to do. Uh, but it doesn't take everybody to do that uh, to to get the necessary results. Now, meanwhile, there are revolutions on the demand side. I'll give you one example because everybody worries about peak air conditioning loads. There was a recent experiment by some Princeton folks in Singapore showing that you can keep people comfortable outdoors in Singapore, although in the shade, at, with 32 degrees C air at 80% relative humidity with no air conditioning and without cooling, chilling, or moving the hot, still, humid air. How do you do that? You put on at least one side of them a metal panel insulated on the other side. You cool the surface of it with some capillary tubes with 23 to 25 C water. So it's about five to seven Celsius subambient. And you protect that cold surface from the hot, humid air by an air gap, thin plastic film. So 82 something percent of the infrared radiated by your body is sucked up by the panel. And they, they got rid of it with a little compression uh, refrigeration machine. I would get rid of it with a heat pipe to a selective radiator that radiates into the infrared window in the sky. Uh, and those radiators of a half dozen kinds now can cheaply dissipate over 100 watts a square meter and give you a lot more than five to seven subambient, even in very humid or cloudy weather. Right. In other words, you can probably do the air conditioning function even in severe tropical climates with no electricity. Wow. And you can probably do that cheaply. Or another example, uh, two examples actually from the, my household. I have a stove over there that <clears throat> is two to four and a half times more efficient than induction and better in all other respects. It's bleeding edge technology. It'll take a while to get on the market because of the usual, you know, inventor, small firm kinds of issues, but uh, that makes it much easier to get off gas because it's a much better way to cook with very little energy. And by the way, if you want hot water, there's a miniature fist size Swiss heat pump with a COP of six to 15 for lifts of 31 to 13 C. Right. And that's 61% of Carno for heaven's sake. Or I'll give you an, another industrial example from JB Straubel, the uh, engineering genius that built a lot of Tesla. So, when he was designing the uh, Tesla Gigafactory for batteries, his first big design choice was there will be no gas pipe. And his colleague said, JB, you must be nuts. We're gonna need a lot of process heat. Everybody knows you do that with gas, it's cheaper. 
Right. He said, no, let's, let's watch. So he goes to the air permit office in Nevada, comes back with the permit at a half hour. Normally it's six months if it's uncontested. What's six months worth in the battery business? Because his factory doesn't burn anything. Right. You know, it's all about my PVs on the roof. Then <clears throat> he starts looking at the process heat loads. And the biggest one is continuously redistilling a critical solvent. That's normally done with a thermal megawatt of gas boilers. He does it with a single electric heat pump of 15 kilowatts. Wow. 98 odd percent less. Why? Because the delta T you need is only one and a half Kelvins, but nobody thought about it that way. Mm. Yeah. So obviously very close to Cardo. And I'll give you a, a transport example. There's a, a couple of little firms I advise, uh, one called aptera.us. You might want to look up A-P-T-E-R-A. They have a under 0.7 liter equivalent per 100 kilometer two seat three wheel vehicle going into production in the coming months. It has less air drag than they say the windshield wipers or the side mirrors on a standard pickup truck. Wow. Uh, so it's it's less than half the drag of a Tesla 0.13 CD uh, or about about half. It's about half the weight and we can make it lighter. So it's equivalent to 343 miles per US gallon. Wow. That means that you don't normally need to plug in because it has three square meters of solar on the roof and that's enough to run normal commuting. So the that's electric recharging infrastructure, most EVs will have to pay for, those guys aim to bypass. Mm -hmm. And you can run it in places that have no fuel and no power. Wow, that, that's a perfect example of something that I've been told is impossible. All the all literature I've read is that solar panels on cars will never provide enough energy to run the car. They're a gimmick, but it's if the car is inefficient. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> or there's a Dutch competitor I also advise called Lightyear.1. And they have one. It, it's a real, real car. It's it's uh, five square meters of solar on the roof, five seats, four wheels, and it's equivalent to 251 or two miles a gallon, 0.9 liters per 100 kilometers. And every hour you park it in the sun, it gains 12 kilometers of range. So it's it, it's like, you know, you, you park your car in the sun and it, it adds two gallons of fuel a day. Yeah, wow, my goodness. So, you know, whether you're talking about industry vehicles, buildings, equipment, the efficiency revolution changes everything. Uh, and let me give you one other little example because we were talking about grid integration. The Texas grid is 99% isolated. It has no big hydro. It's got some difficult climates. And yet, we simulated hourly that you could run it in 2050 entirely on renewables with no bulk storage. How do you do that? Well, you first buy the efficiency that the National Academies 12 years ago set at a 10% real return. And a little bit of demand response, not much. So the load gets smaller and less peaky, but it's still 30 odd peak gigawatts. It's, it's a big load. You then meet, in this case, 86% of the annual electric load with uh, wind and solar, and the other 14% with dispatchable renewables. So that would be geothermal, small hydro, uh, burning biogas or industrial ag or municipal waste or my favorite burning obsolete energy studies. Uh, so now you're 100% renewable, but it's not a great match to the load. But you then take the surplus electricity and put it into two kinds of distributed storage that are worth buying anyway, bidirectional electric vehicles and uh, ice storage air conditioning in big and small buildings. When you put all those pieces together with a little bit of inconspicuous demand response, 
they're 100% renewable every hour of the year and the economics will be terrific and you have only 5% left over. Oh, what do you do with that? You probably make hydrogen or ammonia to decarbonize other parts of the economy. Yeah. See, yeah. Tony Seba pointed out something very important that a lot of folks miss, uh, namely, people who think about the grid think, oh, we're going to have to buy huge overcapacity of solar and wind to cope with the worst conditions and keep the lights on. But most of the time, they'll have nothing to do. We'll have to curtail them. That's a cost. Mm. Meanwhile, there's folks wanting to decarbonize stuff like steel and cement, thinking, oh, we're going to have to build or buy a whole bunch of solar and wind capacity to make hydrogen to clean up our processes. Guess what? It's the same solar and wind counted twice, not right. entirely, but largely, because most of the time, the seemingly excess solar and wind you built for grid reliability and you paid for its capex for that purpose is going to be sitting there at almost no opex you might as well run it to make the power to x green Absolutely. molecules that you need to decarbonize the rest of the economy it's just that nobody looked at the whole economy before and there's not and there's maybe not as much friction there as it appears on the surface because I, I, even some of the literature i've read shows that um natural existing natural gas infrastructure um hydrogen can be used in a lot of those already it's it's not a huge retro uh, it's just a retrofit for some some types it doesn't have to be overhaul it can go in the same pipes that can go in the same compressors so you it's not, it's not drastic. To do like a composite liner to protect the pipe from embrittlement you can probably do that it depends on the pipe right but, but actually it turns out that remote hydrogen production and then having to move the hydrogen around may be costlier than making it where you need it. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, now, uh, you know, the energy is distributed for free. Absolutely. That arranges that. <laughs> and um, barring any any uh, last minute questions from Asala or Priya or Shani or Conrad or anyone before we, we start to wrap up here, probably got another five minutes. Um, because we started five minutes late. Uh, anyone else watching like to chime in with a question for our guests before we before we go? Yes, uh, we have a question in the chat. All right, uh, I can't see it, so go ahead and. Oh, sorry, it's for me. Uh, so the first question is from George Gross. Uh, he asked you to do uh, a question by voice. Let yeah, me just... go ahead, George. So you have to connect him, I think. Yeah, I just unmuted you, George. Yeah, uh, you unmuted me. Thank you very much. So I have a question. Uh, you've you've talked about storage, but what about long duration storage? Well, if you want and need it, you can easily do it with hydrogen or ammonia or other green molecules. But I would caution you: the uh, there's a new NREL paper. Uh, and actually, there are several new papers now. Uh, well, here's here's the most interesting one. Go to the website of five zero hertz h e r t z fifty hertz, which is the ultra reliable former East German and Hamburg grid, and Berlin. Mm -hmm. It's um, I think their last major power failure was like in the nineteen thirties. They're incredibly good engineers. They and Ilya, the Belgian grid, are now uh, combined, and they just put out weeks ago a very important study showing that in Europe, which is the worst place supposedly needing, many say, months of long-duration storage for the, the dark doldrums, the Dunkelflaute, guess what? The actual amount you need once you've done the east-west European interconnectors you need anyway is only a week or two. And the total amount of green molecules you need is only about, on average, 6% of the winter electric consumption. And that's about the hardest place in the world to do it. And by the way, they didn't buy nearly as much efficiency as I would have. Well, so, well um, I can see now with this extreme weather events, which are multiplying every year, 
that I don't think one or two weeks may be enough. I, I think uh, given those forest fires that we have seen, that we, we do need a very different type of energy than we have uh, had uh, 50 years ago. So uh, the idea of really building a very robust, a very resilient system may require uh, uh, the type of storage which we haven't had before, except where we have lots of hydro and we can store poundage over there and so forth. So I, I don't know because uh, anytime we bring in hydrogen, I think it's a, it, it, it certainly should be one of, uh, uh, one of the items in, uh, in, in our bag of goodies, but uh, the price of, of, uh, of creating that hydrogen using green energy is not going to be cheap. I would be careful about that because we will soon be getting electrolyzers like sneakers at the China price. Uh, Bloomberg is very clear on this and they've really dug into it heavily. I was talking a couple of weeks ago to the head of a large chemical company in China that runs on coal and he's mm -hmm. on his iPhone real time uh, in the background, his one gigawatt photovoltaic plant, which is already making PV hydrogen at well under a dollar, uh, $2 a kilogram. Yeah. And there is some uncertainty whether it's 1.2, 1.4 or $1.8 a kilogram, but it's a hell of a deal regardless. And it's already beating his coal. So there's, they're already switching over their production. Thank you, George. I'm going to have to go on just to the get your one concern, last. So your concern is legitimate, but I I think it's readily met. And and one other quick comment: um, a lot of people worry about how you go from 90 to 95 to 100 percent renewable. That's a complete red herring. We, all we know and all we need to know is we have an ample portfolio of attractive ways to do that. We don't need to know exactly what the mix is going to be decades before we need it. As, as the climatologist Ken, Cal Ken Caldera says, uh, don't let uncertainty about the details of the end game interfere with our opening moves. Yeah, that's great. Okay. That's fair. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, sir. We really appreciate you chiming in. Actually, this has been you're one of our first people to get on get on their mic. Um, so thank you, George. Um, good questions. And and one last question here in the chat from A Ferraro. How do we responsibly retire thermal generation without placing the entire burden on the few? Is it not part of the cost of disruptive technology to ethically and responsibly retire technology and should be shared by everyone that benefit by its deployment? Well, most of those assets are actually already amortized. Uh, and most of the rest are pretty old and will soon be amortized. But interestingly, they're uneconomic to operate. That is their operating costs, fuel plus O and M, is typically more than you pay for new renewables to do the same thing. And therefore, especially with today's low cost of capital, uh, <clears throat> you can, <clears throat> for example, securitize or otherwise do efficiently designed financial instruments to retire gracefully the thermal plants and make money on the deal. So the, the best example of this I know, and there, such deals are actually being done in the U.S. and abroad, now increasingly in developing countries, is, is to look up a report called How to Retire Early and make sure you search on RMI, How to Retire Early, otherwise you'll get retirement guides. Yeah. It will show you on empirical data for 95% of the world's coal power fleet that if you uh, were to retire the entire coal fleet in 2020, buy renewables overnight at the then prices, now lower, uh, to do the same thing, keep the lights on just the same, you would be at break even financially within two years, and by 2025, you'd be clearing net over $100 billion a year, assuming that climate mitigation and public health are worth zero. Mm. In other words, that revolution already happened, and the financiers are scrambling to get the business. I don't, however, entirely agree with your thesis. Uh, I don't think Henry Ford had to pay 
for retiring the horse and buggy business. I don't think, uh, I mean, you can come up with example after example. Generally, innovators are not required to pay for any losses incurred by their failed competitors who in the utility case have been amply compensated for all of the risks they bore, including the risk of technology change, and you shouldn't pay them twice. That said, as a matter of political economy and courtesy, you may want to offer them graceful retirement, but you're certainly not obliged to. And and one follow up, because actually you, this, this will be the very last question, because um, you mentioned this kind of in, in a few different um, manifestations throughout our conversation, um, that these things were economically beneficial um, when you really crunched it, it, it just makes sense. It's profitable, it's clean, it's the future. My always kind of what I wanted to ask you is like, well, why, what is really stopping it? Why isn't it, if it, if it is profitable, why aren't these corporations doing it? Like, what's the, what's the, what's stopping it? Well, I, don't, I don't see much stopping it. Look, I, I follow the statistics in lots of languages around the world. So in recent years, I'm just looking over at the stats. Scotland was for a whole year, 97% renewably powered in terms of renewable production versus inland demand. Denmark, 79% because they they have a two year reporting lag. It's more now Germany, 52, Portugal, way out on the end of the European grid, 66, Peninsular Spain, 46, Britain's about half, Ireland's about half. Europe, 38%, the world, 29% last year. That's not stopping. No. That's going at a huge pace. And, and here's a little example. Nuclear last year added 0 0.4 gigawatts more than it retired. And, last, and in, in contrast, at, during the same year, renewables added 278 gigawatts. That's 70, 182 times more in capacity it's about 232 times more in expected annual output using U.S. capacity factors by technology. Game over. Wonderful. I wouldn't guess yeah. that from, from the public discourse, which pretends that, that nuclear is actually useful and thriving and just needs another umpty tens of billions of dollars subsidy to bail it out. Right. But, but it actually makes climate change worse because being costlier, it, it produces fewer kilowatt hours per dollar. That's the reciprocal of costly. Therefore, it can displace less fossil fuel generation per dollar. It also displaces less per year. And new kinds or sizes or fuel cycles will not materially change that. It's for quite fundamental reasons. Uh, so it's well and, on the way. It's all, yeah, it's well efficiency on the way. progresses. So, yeah, there are a lot of obstacles. There are 60 or 80 well known market failures in buying efficiency. Each one can be turned into a business opportunity. This takes relentless patience. It takes meticulous attention to detail. It takes paying attention, but the, the reward is richly worth it. It's trillions of dollars, among other things, and of course, a livable planet. So go for it. Yeah. yeah. You, you and I think it's only fair. I think it's only fair to uh, to give um, Ferraro a chance to to clarify. I think there was maybe something that they wanted. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, sure. You can speak right now. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yep. Okay, you. thank you. I wanted to thank you for your, your response to my question, and I think it may be the limitations of using a chat to enter questions and it got misinterpreted is I wasn't suggesting in the least that we we allow the entrepreneurs and the innovators to double tap their success. But since society benefits from these innovations, and then when we get to their end of life, we are we are saddled with an entire infrastructure throughout this society of those of those technologies. And that I'm suggesting should be a shared responsibility of the society that benefited from them in their retirement and not place it on the few 
that may then be the the shepherds or the caretakers of the technology at its time of retirement. You're talking uh, about the as uh, I mean, for the very same reason, we've had we've had uh, areas of the country described as the Rust Belt. And that was because we did not retire technologies responsibly. Okay. We just we we had a hundred years of wonderful development. We we used it, and then when it came to retirement, we placed it on the societies that happened to have those factories in place, and so they became they went into disuse, and it formed the Rust Belt, and caused a lot of disruption in those people's lives. Okay. That okay. was an irresponsible way to retire technology. Absolutely. So I think what you're asking about is what is often called a just transition. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And I absolutely agree with you. Uh, but there is so much money to be made from the transition that you can easily afford to pay for it. And shame on us if we don't do it. As a small example, uh, the coal miners deserve a just transition but in the United States, we have only half as many coal miners as we have yoga instructors. This is a manageable problem. And it's not only a problem of money, but of dignity and self-worth uh, of building an alternative economy. And actually at Rocky Mountain Institute, we, we had a lot of work on that in the 80s for distressed extractive industry towns in the Intermountain West and came up with very effective tools for building a sustainable local economy from the bottom up, even in places that thought they had nothing going for them. But in every case, when our bottom up analytic and organizing process was applied by ordinary citizens, they came up with terrific ideas that worked very well. They, they all had hidden resources they didn't realize they had uh, that could let them rebuild the basis of, of a sound economy and a decent life. And that, that's what we ought to be doing everywhere uh, a, the transition is needed. And another dimension of that, which you didn't mention, but I think we would also agree about, uh, is, is the environmental justice dimension that many uh, communities have suffered very disproportionately from the harm of the traditional energy system, and they deserve priority in getting the good stuff that the rest of us enjoy uh, to promote uh, their own health and quality of life. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that was a robust conversation and it was an absolute pleasure to have you on. And I really, I'm, I'm really grateful to Torado and the previous speaker, George. Um, thank you both so much for speaking. Um, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Lovins. I, I really do appreciate it. And um, thanks for going on all the tangents that I sometimes take things on. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, I hope you'll all go forth and be fruitful and subtract. Yes, absolutely. If anyone, <laughs> if anyone wanted to um, follow you or follow up or, or, or see what you're doing, where could they uh, find you? Uh, activities at rmi.org. That's Rocky Mountain Institute. I'm, I'm still there a third time. And I'm teaching half time in engineering at Stanford. You can reach me at a b l o v i n s at stanford.edu. I may not be able to reply immediately, but I'll I'll do what I can. Excellent. And we'll be we'll be continuing the conversation on LinkedIn. If anyone's one, uh, wondering, we can take this conversation there, and we'll we'll keep going. Thank you so much, everyone, and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you, sir. And thank you all for organizing. Thanks, Lynn. Of course. Cheers. Thank Good you. Night.